going to get started shortly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, we see the room is filling up, which is good news. Wonderful. I think we've got uh, a few more people. If you can take your seats, uh, we'll get started. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this session. It's all about driving e-mobility in Asia Pacific and beyond. My name is Sharon Jeet Lail. It's a real delight and pleasure to be your host and moderator for this session. Now, over the next 90 minutes, we'll aim to explore key trends in key transport, uh, including the ADB's uh, approach to promoting e-mobility across all major transport forms, such as rail, buses, metro, and of course, electric vehicles. Now, we've brought together a great panel of speakers, uh, all of whom, of course, play a very critical role in the successful transformation of e-mobility at a time of climate change. So I'd like to introduce our opening speaker, who will set the stage for us in terms of the importance of green transport. Ramesh Subramaniam is the Director General of the Chief uh, Sectors Group from the Asian Development Bank, who's going to kick off with an overview of the ADB's assistance of e-mobility in sovereign and non-sovereign operations. Please, a round of applause for Ramesh. Thank you so much, um, Sharanjit, um, and good afternoon to all of you. Nice to see a number of you, and hopefully more will be coming. Um, it's my privilege to welcome you all to this, uh, to this uh, workshop and particularly those of you who are coming from outside of Georgia, um, special welcome to Tbilisi, uh, and, and we are obviously super happy to uh, be hosting uh, this. Uh, this seminar, Driving E-Mobility in Developing Asia and the Pacific, um, you know, if I say this is coming at a critical juncture, that will be a cliche. Uh, we all know, particularly those of us coming from developing countries in Asia, elsewhere, uh, know the urban mobility challenges that we face. Tbilisi seems actually okay. I don't know what people of Tbilisi feel, but come to Manila, where uh, we are based uh, at the ADB, uh, or to Jakarta, or to New Delhi, or to Mumbai, or Chennai, the city where I come from, uh, you know what we are talking about in terms of the need for change uh, and, and the transformation that uh, we need to go through. Um, because urban air quality, just to start with, is a huge challenge. And, and then you've got lots and lots of other uh, challenges in terms of lack of mobility, uh, what, what that means. Uh, so transportation obviously forms the backbone of uh, economies uh, by connecting people to jobs, education, healthcare, and obviously uh, economic opportunities. Um, but this comes at a cost. Obviously, transportation contributes nearly a quarter of the global carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, now, this is a, a very alarming statistic, but it also underscores the critical need for urgent and transformative action, which is why we are gathered here today. Uh, the panel will be going into a number of um, the aspects. Uh, in Asia, the Pacific, the region uh, has been experiencing rapid transport uh, demand expansion. Uh, the shift to uh, e-mobility presents not just challenges, but also immense opportunities. Uh, Asia, in fact, is already leading uh, the way globally in e-vehicle or electric vehicle adoption, uh, being home to over 95% of the world's e-vehicles. While this is very impressive, uh, these figures representing a, represent a relatively small fraction of the total vehicles we have in many of the Asian cities as well as countries, underscoring the need for accelerating uh, the transition from uh, the polluting vehicles to electric autom uh, alternatives. Um, again, you know, Manila will take the liberty of being uh, home to ADB. Uh, we've got the jeepneys, or you have tuk-tuks in uh, many parts of the world, the autos in uh, India, for instance. All of these obviously need to be transitioned. Uh, now, obviously, all of this needs a lot of money, but more than equally important, more than, I was going to say more than money, money is important, but equally important is uh, enabling policy frameworks, uh, which need to be effective and efficient 
uh, for scaling up e-mobility. Um, many developing economies have uh, robust e-mobility policies, but there are a number of others that uh, yet need to uh, effectively integrate uh, these policies into their NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, or other long-term strategies leading to net zero. This obviously highlights a need for a more integrated approach and closer coordination between transport and climate policies at both national as well as global levels. At the ADB, we are super committed to supporting this transformation through a comprehensive approach that spans all major transport forms. Uh, to date, ADB has financed over 75,000 e-vehicles and more than 5,000 kilometers of electric railways affecting positively millions of daily lives and contributing to the creation of thousands of jobs. Uh, just this year, the Green Climate Fund approved $170 million of funding to ADB for decarbonization of the transport sector that along with ADB's own resources will uh, finance about close to half a billion dollars of investments in seven of our developing member countries. Um, the e-mobility program, this program that I just mentioned, aims to foster a transformational shift in public transport across uh, seven countries. Many of them are in Central Asia and the Caucasus, including Georgia, potentially mitigating around 11.4 million tons of CO2 equivalent over 25 years and benefiting millions directly and indirectly. Our private sector operations, Mayank will be speaking later, Kathy is here, many other colleagues, they've been doing tremendous, uh, putting in tremendous efforts uh, in the space. In Georgia, for example, we've invested in the pioneering Tegeta Green Vehicles Bond Project. In Thailand, uh, our private sector operations have supported the financing of e-tuk-tuks. And in Vietnam, we contributed to uh, creating the first national electric vehicle charging uh, network. Uh, now, through uh, ADB's finance, uh, sovereign finance, enabling environment, as well as private sector finance, we seek to catalyze investments that advance large-scale adoption of green transport solutions. Uh, now, decentral decarbonization policies, such as incentives for EV purchase uh, and support for renewable energy integrations uh, are very, very critical. Now, they are the key ingredient in establishing an overall enabling environment to decarbonize the transport sector. They not only help mitigate the environmental impacts, but also enhance energy security and economic uh, resilience. Uh, now, there may be scientists and researchers in this audience. Uh, the innovations, the work that you are doing in battery technology and renewable energy solutions are the backbone of this transition. We are at the tip of this transition. A lot more needs to happen in terms of new uh, advances and innovations. We at the ADB, as a knowledge institution uh, promoting innovation, we depend on your expertise to expand the boundaries of what is possible in e-mobility. And to our institutional investors, and maybe people with money, uh, whether uh, pension funds, others who are investing, uh, we, uh, your strategic insights and financial commitments are vital for scaling up the e-mobility solutions. Uh, so thank you all very much for your commitment to this transformative journey. And we look forward to collaborating with you. And this panel will be very exciting in looking at a whole range of issues. Thank you so much, Saranjit. Thanks all. Thank you, Ramesh. And thank you for so ably uh, underscoring why this panel is so urgent. Uh, of course, you know, a massive amount of uh, global emissions uh, out there, and we need to cut it. So let me introduce our amazing panelists for the session. We have Philip Turner, Director for Global Advocacy and Engagement at SlowCat. This is an organization uh, made up of partnerships that are powering a just transition towards healthy, green, resilient transport and mobility systems for people and the planet. A round of applause for Philip, please. Thank you. You can come and join me here. Next, we have Mayank Chowdhury. He's the director from the Infrastructure Finance Division and Private Sector Operations Department from the ADB. He has more than 22 years of corporate finance, investment banking, private equity, and project finance experience in the infrastructure sector across Asia. Thank you, Mayank. A round of applause. <laughs> and next, from right here in Georgia, we have Manana Akishas. Kinashvili, 
She did tell me how to pronounce her name. I hope I have done it uh, justice. She is the head of investor relations at Tajeta. And uh, of course, we know that's a leading automotive company in Georgia. Uh, she expanded its investor base uh, to include 500 institutional, individual, international, and local stakeholders. And of course, amongst these transactions that she will go on to talk about is the issuance of the first green bond in collaboration with the ADB, the first of its kind in the automotive sector. Uh, across the entire region. And next up we have Jamie Lever, the director for the Transport Sector Group from the ADB with over 30 years of experience in transport, working in different parts of the world with development organizations, governments, private sector and research institutions. Finally, we have Samir Agarwal. He's the founder and CEO of Revfin Services, which is transforming the EV ecosystem and driving the adoption of electric vehicles across India with a specific focus on the financially excluded segment. Welcome. A Big round of applause, please. And thank you all for being here. And I'm so excited for the next uh, 90 minutes or so, we'll have this conversation. But of course, it's not just a conversation amongst ourselves. We want to hear from you. So please, uh, we'll have a QR code that's going to come up on the screen shortly. Take your phones out, scan it, because this is your chance to ask us questions. And I will be putting your questions to our panelists at the end of the session. There's your QR code. If you could all take your, uh, uh, your phones, your tablets out right now, scan it, please. I would love to be able to, um, of course, pose your questions uh, to our panelists. But let's start with an opening question to all of you, and really just to answer briefly about uh, how you and your organizations are contributing to reducing global greenhouse gases, which as you just heard uh, Ramesh says, he said it contributes to nearly a quarter of the global carbon uh, dioxide emissions. So really a chance to know where you stand on this debate. Uh, let's start with you, Philip. Okay, um, well, firstly, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. So SLOCAT is uh, a multi-stakeholder partnership which brings together around 100 organizations globally. And we are essentially the voice of the sustainable transport community in the international climate talks, but also the wider sustainability agenda. Um, our focus is on the land transport sector, so we bring together all sustainable transport modes, walking, cycling, public transport, rail, but also city authorities, uh, national governments, UN agencies. Um, so our mission is very much ensuring that ambitious global agreements harness the full benefit of sustainable transport. Secondly, raising awareness uh, with national governments on the actions and the policies that they can take um, on sustainable transport. And fi finally, really enhance the dialogue between state and non-state actors. Um, so SLOCAT is the co-focal point for the UNFCCC uh, in the transport sector. So really that's about raising awareness on what works and what doesn't. Good to know, that's a long list. My young. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, as, as I was introduced, I am the uh, private sector part of ADB. So uh, since this sector is very new, it's about four to five years since we've been engaged in this sector, but we have been fortunate enough to actually been able to work across uh, geographies, across instrument types, uh, which I'll talk about subsequently in, uh, in later in this panel discussion. Uh, so we have uh, right from you know battery manufacturing, charger manufacturing to e vehicle manufacturing, uh, including uh, two wheelers, uh, light commercial vehicles, uh, buses, to charging infrastructure, uh, to uh, uh, financing of infrastructure uh, EVs. Uh, across the spectrum, uh, we have created these lighthouse projects, which actually can act as a, uh, as a signal or a trigger for the broader commercial market, you know, to start ad adopting. So, so I, I will get a chance to speak about it later in details. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bayank. And I, I should have said I should have gone to Jamie first because they're both ADB, but they represent two different, very poor, di different parts of the ADB. Uh, we'll he hear from Jamie a, a little bit. But Manana, tell us about Dageta. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here from the host country, and it's a 
great pleasure to speak about our company. So Together is the leader company in automotive industry, not only in Georgia, but also in the Caucasus. So since, uh, I would say, 1995, we are trying to be pioneering in different areas of the automotive and not only even the financial instruments that we've been using, and as you have mentioned, the green bonds transactions and different ones. And uh, in terms of the climate changes and e-mobility, we started about five years ago to modernize the uh, vehicles in Georgia, and we have uh, imported like hybrid vehicles and started to import uh, electric vehicles as well and uh, established charging stations for these electric vehicles as well. So we are representatives of the exclusive representatives of different brands all around the, kind of all, all around the globe, like 500 and more. Porsche, Volvo, and uh, other brands that are manufacturing EV uh, charging stations as well, and as well as for the vehicles. That's wonderful. Summary. That's a, a great list of things. And of course, we'll hear a little bit more about uh, the green bonds in a bit. Uh, Jamie, yes, please do uh, distinguish what you do from Mayank within the ADB. Well, let me start. ADB is totally committed. We have announced ourselves as the climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. It's all very well just saying that, but we're putting financial resources behind that. Cumulatively to 2030, we are committed to su provide financial support for 100 billion US dollars. And happy to say at the moment, we're, we're on track for that. And it's through investments like e-mobility, e through rail as a lower, lower part, but also across in, in other sectors as well. So that's the corporate level. We've, we've heard that there is a private sector role and a sovereign support, that enabling environment that Ramesh was referring to at the beginning. Even within the sector, it probably goes beyond that. We are looking at how the transport sector can work with the energy sector to make sure there's collaboration, how we can work with our urban colleagues to work with cities to make sure that the, that function and livability and sustainability of the city is also be decarbonizing. So corporately, we have set these targets. The, the sovereign support, the policy, the investments, and certainly the private sector, and working with our other energy sectors, urban sectors, and, and industry to see how we can push that agenda forward. Uh, and the number was given at the beginning. It's around a quarter of sector emissions. Transport falls under that hard to abate area. So what can we do to push the very impressive numbers we've seen, but it's a very s s small point at the moment. How can we accelerate that up? uptick in e-mobility. E Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to hear more about that uh, just a little bit later when we get into the session. And, and Samir, finally, from uh, Refin's point of view. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Refin finances commercial electric vehicles in India. Um, we provide finance in form of loans and leases for electric vehicles. Uh, so far, we have financed over 50,000 electric vehicles. And today, we are present in over 750 <laughs> towns and cities in India. Uh, I think one of the things that we observe is that um, a lot of the electric vehicle adoption is happening in smaller towns uh, from people who come from a near bottom of the pyramid uh, social strata. Uh, so we've been working a lot with that customer segment. Over 96% of our customers come from non-tier one cities and over 85% of our customers are financially excluded and have never taken a loan in the past. Thank you, and, and very good to know. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, customer base of yours a little later as well. But let's move on to Manana now. Uh, of course, you know, you mentioned Tegeta and all the incredible things Tegeta is doing, um, and one of which was really to issue the first green bond uh, and very much, uh, you know, contributing to decarbonizing uh, the transport sector in Georgia by doing that. Uh, talk us through Tegeta's motivation and experience in that and the role that the ADB played in that. Thank you, that's a brilliant question. I would uh, start with the ADB's role in this transaction that's been crucial for us to achieve these numbers that I will go through. Like, uh, it's been a year already that we have issued this bond. This transaction was one of a kind in uh, Caucasus and in Georgia. Uh, like green bonds, we've issued 20 million gel. That's uh, the national currency of uh, Georgia as well. And uh, for this, we have another aim to give five times investments to the country for the EV direction. So this kind of translates into 100 million large investments in EV direction 
and not only speaking of the mobility and the vehicles itself, but speaking of the charging stations, that is the crucial part to modernize and decarbonize the country. Like as of today, we have uh, achieved the numbers, uh, like we've imported more than 200 vehicles already and uh, purchased 70 charging stations already that we start to establish all around the country for the use of the end, uh, end users to make it more appearing and uh, so on. So we, uh, step by step, we will establish and uh, speaking of the motivation of the company, uh, since I have mentioned that uh, our suppliers are from the all over the world, like the leading companies, so these companies are moving towards the decarbonization, GHG emissions reductions, and uh, so we also want to move to this path and increase the Georgia's and not only Georgia's decarbonization impacts and be the one, they be the leader in the country who will contribute. And uh, hopefully we've seen another bond in a month, uh, last year, one month later, but since we've issued as well, and uh, we, we've seen another insurance from the financial institutions as well, from the private companies, that is very important for us to see since we are, uh, we'll be honored to share our experience working with ADB and uh, yes, uh, achieving these great things here. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear, and perhaps we can uh, elaborate a little bit more about ADB's role in that, uh, those amazing strides that Tageta is uh, making. Now, Philip, you mentioned earlier, obviously, SlowCat uh, represents sustainable, low-carbon transport. It plays a pivotal role uh, for the transport sector in global agreements. So what have you seen uh, in terms of the transport sector's involvement in the global climate change debate? Okay. Um, I've been going to COPT now, well, so the climate talks for a decade and a half now. You thought I would have learnt better. Um, but the, the question brings very ma happy memories and, and some terrible ones. Um, but I think the, the, the transport discussion at the COP has evolved significantly. When I first started, we weren't even allowed to talk about sectors. Um, it was only emissions and economy-wide issues. I was even told not to talk about transport in certain meetings. Um, and I think really the turning point actually came in uh, 2014 at the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit, where he tasked non-state actors, i.e. anyone other than government, to come up with initiatives to say what they're going to be doing to address climate change, from e-mobility initiatives to rail to public transport. And essentially that was designed to put pressure on governments to come up with an agreement in Paris. But the important thing for me is that the Paris Agreement built on that and set up a formal mechanism where the COP presidency appoint champions to build that relationship with the state and non-state actors and set targets in key areas where they feel that the big gains need to be met. And in the transport sector, we saw a lot of targets being set around e-mobility, covering the different modes. And I, I really see that this has been taken up by the COP presidencies themselves, where they are coming up with their own initiatives, um, especially around e-mobility, where countries are actually signing up to do things. But So it's really gained that momentum, and I think at COP28 uh, in December this year, we made a significant breakthrough. Uh, transport was recognized for the first time in the agreement, and it calls on countries to essentially look at um, emissions reductions through a range of pathways in the road transport sector, looking at infrastructure investments and how to scale up low emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles. So you can actually see the whole evolution of how transport has featured within that debate. And I think that's also now being reflected by countries. So every five years, countries have to update their national climate strategies. In their first set, they only um, set 20% of all their, the strategies looked at transport and only around sort of 3% set targets. Five years later, 98% um, look, specify transport, 33% um, uh, target emissions reductions in the sector, um, and importantly, half of all the interventions actually put forward by government is um, geared at e-mobility solutions. So I've seen that massive evolution uh, over the course of a decade, and I, I think really the challenge now is you've got all these commitments, now you actually have to go and deliver them.
That's a tough call, isn't it? And, and great that you have personally seen those massive strides being taken. Let's hope for yet more strides. Um, my uncle, I mean, you talked a little bit about your role uh, within the ADB earlier, and obviously, you know, the urgent need to transition uh, to cleaner transport. Um, talk us through the different uh, private financing instruments that are available out there to, to boost e-mobility, because this is crucial. Money is crucial, as we heard Ramesh say earlier. Uh, and tell us a little bit about the trends or projects in the private sector that you're seeing, particularly uh, in e-mobility, where the ADB has been involved. Yes. So this is a very important question because this is a whole, uh, you know, foundation of uh, these discussions as to what can, because this will be led by the private sector. I mean, governments will frame policies, government will provide some subsidy, some enabling environment, but ultimately this whole thing has to be driven by the private sector. So at the private sector operations department of ADB, at ADB, we have actually used primarily two instruments to actually support except uh, the data, which was a green bond, which is a separate discussion we can have uh, uh, on this. But br primarily two instruments are an early stage venture investing through our ADB Ventures program and through a blended finance, uh, uh, some concessional loan blended with commercial finance from ADB by mobilizing other commercial lenders. So if I can give some examples, uh, through ADB Ventures program, we have created uh, e-mobility as a service platform in India. Uh, for last mile connectivity uh, for the logistics companies. There is a, a, another company which is actually manufacturing light commercial vehicles, e electric light commercial vehicles, and selling to various, uh, you know, again, delivery platforms which are using uh, last mile connectivity. There is actually our uh, investing company, Refin, which is actually accelerating financing for EVs. Uh, that's also uh, uh, playing a very important role. In Vietnam, we have created uh, a company, supported a company which is manufacturing electric scooters, again, for logistics. Uh, uh, and, and in Bangladesh, we have created a battery swapping network across uh, the country. So these, as you can see, uh, these are very small, early stage investments to create, you know, this whole ecosystem which is missing. Uh, you know, uh, and and of course, the sector, as you know, is d dominated by large uh, international uh, automobile manufacturers, which are actually not focusing on this. Uh, and 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 as part of all these investments, what is also happening is we are also pushing through with creation of infrastructure, which is charging infrastructure, and also a very important aspect which people miss out in what electricity is being used to charge these vehicles. You know, uh, I mean, if it is from the grid, which is most in most of our developing member countries is still primarily coal or gas driven, you're actually removing tailpipe emissions, but you're actually not mitigating CO2 emissions. So you are, yes, you're solving air pollution problem, but you're not solving global warming problem. So, so we are trying to create platforms which actually use renewable energy for charging. Uh, so I'll come to some of those examples. So through our commercial activity, uh, which is lending primarily for ADB, we are act, uh, using blended finance program. So we have a certain pool of capital which donors have provided us, uh, who, which can be blended uh, with commercial financing from ADB and other commercial sources to accelerate some of the higher risk or uh, you know high cost uh, uh, investments which are needed. So yeah, we all know that, right? On a total cost of ownership basis, electric vehicles are cheap as compared to ICE, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. But upfront cost is very high. So that needs support. Uh, that needs support. So, so we use blended finance program. So we have, uh, in, under that program, e took Turks manufacturing. There is a elect uh, battery manufacturing uh, we have done. We have deployed electric buses in India on long-term intercity routes. Uh, then we have actually create, uh, supported a company which most people are aware, are aware of, Winfast in Vietnam, which is actually manufacturing electric buses and rolling out charging infrastructure across the country. So through this, uh, we have gained certain experiences, uh, certain models are emerging, uh, and, and those models we want, hope to replicate and roll out across a wider spectrum of developing member countries. Thank you for that. That, that is an extraordinary number of uh, activities you're involved in, and, and really, interesting to hear how you are going into these markets, uh, Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, Georgia, to create the ecosystem that's necessary to enable 
e-mobility. Uh, you mentioned working with Refin there, and that brings me to Samir uh, very nicely. So Samir, tell us about what you see in your market in India about uh, electric mobility transforming the last mile commute for the lower middle income population that you say you serve. You know, can electric vehicles realistically replace your traditional inter internal combustion engine vehicles in India, is that likely to happen um, at any stage? Well, the short answer is yes, it can and it will happen. Uh, and I can say uh, with confidence in India that will happen in the next two to three years. Uh, now, let me just set some context. Uh, last, mile, oh, sorry, last mile mobility for passengers in India is dominated by three wheelers. Today, 55%, even more than 55% of three wheelers sold in India are, are electric. And if you look at in the mid-income group in smaller towns, um, it's interesting because most of the adoption is over there. Um, over 80% of new three-wheelers being sold are electric. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, uh, northern states of India, they tend to be very uh, highly uh, populated, very dense population. You go to small towns over there, you see nothing but electric vehicles, right? So they've directly leapfrogged from driving manual rickshaws, uh, cycle rickshaws, to electric, and there was no ice in between, right? So I think, um, so yeah, I think um, uh, that adoption is surely happening. Of course, it's not an easy uh, adoption. Uh, it provides a lot of opportunities because electric vehicles actually do help people make more money than ice vehicles, um, either because of uh, the operational cost saving in terms of fuel costs, but also depending on the type of vehicles. Uh, India has this unique uh, product called an e-rickshaw, which is like a one meter wide three wheeler, uh, which runs on batteries. It costs less than $2,000. So it's actually very cheap as well to buy and run. Right? So I think those are some of the opportunities. Yeah, that's very impressive. Uh, and as we saw at the opening video as well, India has incredibly uh, impressive ambitions uh, towards e-mobility. And you've just spelt it out for us, you know, uh, the fact that they will all be e-mobile uh, vehicles in two to three years. That is extraordinary and wonderful to hear. Now, Jamie, we've already heard from Manana a little bit about how the ADP, ADP played a, a pivotal role in helping to get her with its first uh, green bond. But how do you see the role of multinational development banks like the ADB in supporting uh, and enabling environment for e-mobility? And uh, you know, we heard a little bit about that from Mayank earlier as well. Thank you. The role of MDBs or ADB in particular is really to, as you said, that enabling environment, but what work, what technical and financial support can we provide to our governments and private sector? I think all of the panelists have shown how there is a need for that integration. Just to reiterate that point, the four countries that our private sector operations have been working in mostly and highlighting it, it's no accident that those are the four of the five countries in the region that have by far the greatest depth in their e-mobility policies. And that de-risks the private sector investments. So coming from the, the sovereign side in terms of decarbonization of the sector and promotion of e-mobility, we're very much in favor of the avoid, shift, improve mantra for decarbonization of the sector. Avoiding, as we unfortunately all realized during COVID, the reducing the need for travel, working from home. So that's the avoid part of less emissions, less travel. Shifting to different modes, that can be on freight. Rail, water-based transport is far more energy efficient, therefore emits a lot less. And in urban areas, public transport, non-motorized transport, e-vehicles, um, much less emitting than private combustion engine, so let avoid, shift, improve. The, the reason we're here talking on e-mobility, yes, it's attractive, it's getting a lot of attention, but in that avoid, shift, and improve for the decarbonization of the sector, the vast majority of benefits or decarbonization are likely to come from technological in, improvements. In land-based transport, shifting from internal combustion engines, the ICE vehicles, to e-mobility or hybrid, through that transition. Um, but when I said we're helping in that decarbonization pathway to, to governments to set those policies, we're not just looking at land transport, we're looking at maritime, aviation. And some 
fruit is very low hanging. Again, no surprise, we're hearing a lot on two wheelers and three wheelers. We're hearing a lot about electric buses because the analysis shows that the tipping point from capital cost, purchase cost, and operating cost has already been reached. So if you have perfect knowledge, you should be, and you want to purchase a two wheeler or a three wheeler or a fleet vehicle in urban area or a taxi fleet or a bus fleet, it's a no-brainer decision. You should be going down the electric route if you have that knowledge and if you're looking at full life cycle. As was said, the capital cost is higher, but the downstream operating costs are lower. So the tipping point has been reached. And again, picking up the issue in terms of e-mobility in Asia is, is, is very different from other parts of the world, particularly North America or Europe. The, the types of trips, the types of vehicles are quite different. If any of you have visited South or Southeast Asia, and I guess Vietnam is perhaps the most well-known in terms of its sea of two-wheelers coming at you as you try to cross the street, but many South and Southeast Asian countries are the same, that tipping point in those types of vehicles has been reached. Um, so that, on the financial part, if this is to feed through into private sector investments and decisions, it will be a financial investment not steered by the policies, but who will make those investments and that requirement. That's the low-hanging fruit, the sort of middle-hanging fruit of the private four-wheelers, the trucks, aviation and maritime. Unfortunately, at the moment, fruit higher up the tree. But as, as Ramesh was saying, if there's any technology researchers in the audience, we will look at this and bring those in, and that's that full decarbonisation pathway. Thank you for that. And, and as you say, there's, there's so many elements to it. It is incredibly complex to get to the next stage, but it looks like here within the region, we have managed to, to get there. It's really about um, hastening that pace. Um, at this point of the conversation, I realize we still have a full hour ahead. I would love to hear from you in the audience. So if you had a chance to um, scan the QR code a little bit earlier, I do want to ask your questions, and I'm sure you have many, many questions for our very engaging panelists here. They've already spoken so much about this sector, but I'm sure you're very curious to hear. There are no questions at the moment. I do hope that uh, you'll think up some great ones over the next uh, half an hour or so. Uh, Manana, I'm gonna move over to you now. A, a very similar question to you that I just asked um, Jamie, but you know, in, uh, in a different um, area. Uh, what is your recommendation uh, to other private companies like yourself or even uh, public sector entities to further help support e-mobility? What kind of advice would you give them? Thanks, that's a, also a brilliant question as well. Um, short answer there is that go for it. So there are no limitations where you should do it or should not do it. So this is the future and the future is today. So there's no another answer that you go or no go. go. And uh, the technical support you're getting within these bond issuances or even the loan disbursements or anything that's enormous, like I see Begum from Sustain Analytics here, she helped us very well. So I see David and the ADB team here who were very supportive with this transition. And yes, um, even though the journey might seem a bit long, it's fruitful and it's Yes, and um, you'll get the support you need. For the private sector, That's uh, we are the drivers here for the changes. I mean, sometimes in prior to the public sector itself, like for example, I, I was speaking about the 70 chargers for the EVs, like we've started to implement the step by step, by step but without the public support and the governmental support, it would be, wouldn't be possible. So we're covering the whole Georgia, we're covering the Tbilisi itself, and uh, the support from the government and city hall is uh, enormous here. They also encourage us to do that. And yes, there is no limit to doing that. And as for the uh, light vehicles, I would not say, I would not stop for the only the individual purposes. Uh, Jamie also has mentioned about the buses here. So here if uh, transitioning is the crucial for the road vehicles itself and non-road vehicles, infrastructural developments for the projects. Like uh, Georgia is very uh, heavy on industrial infrastructural projects as well. And uh, we do have uh, capability to provide these 
vehicles and techniques and all of the support so they need. So there are other players in the country in terms of automotive in industry and the financial support as well, like leasing instruments and banking instruments are very uh, attractive pricing here, have very attractive pricing here, so uh, they should also join this ecosystem to make this change today. Thank you, and, and uh, as you point out, you know, government support is crucial. Um, that's the voice that we're lacking on our panel at the moment, but it'd be interesting to hear from any um, uh, government sector uh, individuals who might be in the audience. We'd love your input. Uh, once again, if you had a chance to scan that QR code, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and yes, I mean, political capital, absolutely necessary in, in trying to achieve uh, e-mobility milestones. Uh, Philip, I'm moving on to you next because obviously you've come across uh, many of those politicians at many of the, the COP and other uh, climate summits that you've been to. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges to the uptake of e-mobility solutions around the world? Um, and what are some of the opportunities? We know there are plenty. Okay, I, th I think the biggest challenge is that we've got two years to get it right. Um, national governments have to come forward at COP30 at the end of next year to outline their new climate strategies. Um, and these essentially have to say what countries are going to do by 2035. Um, the decision over that period will either lock yourself in to a zero emissions future or a high emissions future. Um, I think it's very important to remember these national climate strategies are political commitments. They are commitments from countries to say how they will contribute to the Paris Agreement. Um, so they have some weight behind them. Um, the current pledges that we have on the table, uh, transport emissions are going to increase by 10%. Uh, that's pretty much the wrong way, uh, as, as I understand it. Um, and when I actually, I've, I've read every single national climate strategy. Um, it's a labor of love. I can tell you, but half of the countries do include e-mobility strategies, targets, policies, but practically none of them include what they're going to be doing for the infrastructure to charge them. Um, there's no point in buying an electric bus if it can't run. Uh, I don't see any benefit in that. Um, and depending on kind of who you talk to, we know that we really need to significantly scale up um, public transport charging infrastructure, say, for private vehicles up 14-fold on current rates, um, buses and trucks up 20-fold by 2035. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I, but I think that the, the actual opportunity lies in these NDC updates. Um, currently, they're too vague to really know what they're going to be doing. Um, so it's therefore very difficult to hold governments to account. Um, so I think that, that really climate strategies have to be more specific. They need to really outline what their vision is for their transport sector um, over that period and how it will deliver this net zero future that we're all um, looking towards. Um, countries really need to spell out how they're going to reduce emissions across the avoid, shift, improve approach. Um, because there isn't a silver bullet solution uh, to reducing emissions from the sector. We need very, very clear targets to say um, where we're going to be going for e-mobility. Um, that provides market confidence. Uh, we need these modal shift targets. We need the integration with renewable energy as well. Um, we need to say who's going to be the lead ministry. Um, National climate strategies are often led by the Environment Ministry. The Transport Ministry doesn't get a look in. Um, so we need to know who's going to deliver it and also how they're going to work with their partners, the private sector and cities as well. Um, we need to say how much it's going to cost and who's going to pay for it. Uh, that's another one. Um, capacity building. Um, we're dealing with new technologies. Uh, we need to build those cap capabilities if we're going to be delivering them in cities. But we also need to bring up the capabilities of our governance arrangements in cities as well. Um, and my kind of final point is the monitoring, reporting, and the verification. We need to ensure that these policies actually deliver emissions reductions, but also actually make 
our cities, citizens, um, better places to live because um, we really need to measure the sustainability benefits because if you do that, then that helps the, the, the real political drive behind it all. So I really do see that, that, that we have quite a, quite a significant challenge, but many opportunities. Good to hear. And yeah, that is so eloquently put in terms of the kind of massive challenges, the cost, uh, obviously trying to work out who's doing what uh, within government. And, and as you say, you've read all those national policies and they are vague. Uh, which really suggests there's a, a very large mountain to climb. I, I'm going to skip ahead again. Uh, perhaps I'll go to Jamie, because I saw you nodding uh, very, very much to whatever Philip was saying there. And of course, he was making some great points. So give us a sense of the complexities involved, because there are so many, aren't there, in terms of the, the cost for the infrastructure to put all of this into place. It's not enough to say, yes, let's get some e-mobile green buses, because... That, there's a whole infrastructure element about that. So explain a little bit about that. I'd, I'd like to explain a little bit, or try to explain a little bit, on the institutional complexities as well. I, I think what Philip was saying is that has transport had a seat at the table? It, yes, today, but 10 years ago, 15 years ago, much less so. Um, but are, is our seat fully at the table, or are we whispering things that may not be picked up when it comes to NDCs and LTSs? maybe my labour of love was, was reading through all the transport policies that governments have produced across Asia and Pacific region. And there are an awful lot of climate-related decarbonisation documentation policies within the transport documents. Um, only 10% of those have migrated themselves across to the NDCs. So if, if we're saying rightly that there is not enough information or detailed information in the climate documentation, the NDCs, the LTSs, relating to transport, in many of our client governments, that, that information is there, but it's sitting in the transport document. So it's a, a simple migration of those agreed government policies from the transport sector into the collaborated, coordinated uh, climate change document. So that... It is good news that there's ready-made policies that can be put in to enhance that, that move forward, but it does require closer collaboration within the institutions to get that there. That would very much help the enabling environment. And then to go to your point in terms of the broader complexities, again, it, it, on the sovereign side, the government can set those, the, the enabling environment, and as I said earlier, it will de-risk individuals' decisions or private sector operators' decisions to invest that way. If you know that your vehicle will be obsolete within the next 10 years, your decision to select a different type of vehicle, hybrid, electric, compared to combustion engines, is, is, is sort of made for you, or at least accelerated for you for that part. But we do need to work with the vehicle manufacturers. We need to work with the power generation to ensure that this policy is there. Um, just on that power, e-vehicles are a lot more energy efficient than their ICE equivalents. There's much fewer moving parts, therefore a lot less friction. Therefore, e even though the grid may not be 100% clean, use of, e sorry, use of power generation within e-vehicles is actually more efficient than internal combustion engines and fossil fuel use. So, and also the, the policies for the energy sector are, are more advanced and that decarbonisation pathway in the energy sector for cleaner energy is, it, it will probably accelerate before the full scaling up of e-mobility adoption. So it, it will happen, but it's not a case of just trust me, but the policies back this up as well. The, the, the energy sector will decarbonise. The, the, the power comparison between combustion engines and e-vehicles is, is more advantageous on the e-vehicle side. Um, so these things are all sort of falling in place. But the final straw is then maybe on the manufacturing side. So yes, there's government, there's private sector, but who is producing these? Where are the raw materials coming from at, at the end of life? Where will that be used? So we need to look at all of those components to ensure supply chains, um, environmental impacts, particularly at end of use or end of life or second life, we like to refer to because those batteries can be very powerful. 
they may have deteriorated, so they may not be so useful within a vehicle, but they will be very useful in terms of energy storage for households who may be off the grid. So there's a, definitely a second life before end of life in terms of batteries that we can get within there. So we're looking at all of these parts. Again, referring back to what I said earlier in terms of the Asia and Pacific being quite different from maybe North America or Europe, two-wheelers, three-wheelers are often locally produced to, to a large extent. So we're not dealing with major international players as we would be in the family car market or the light-duty vehicle market. And that allows us to sort of pilot options and scale them up because they, if, they, if the tuk-tuks, three-wheelers, rickshaws, whatever, are sort of locally produced, then working with those local producers to bring in that shift um, it gives us a greater, a larger opportunity to bring in that other dimension, government, private sector, and vehicle manufacturers, industries as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thanks for setting the context and explaining the very, very many complexities there are, not just in terms of infrastructure, but in terms of the institutional complexities as, as well. Um, Samir, moving on to you now. Um, Obviously, we heard a little bit about financing earlier, but perhaps explain what role financing plays for Revfin uh, in helping transform the sector. Because we know, you mentioned earlier, of course, your customer who are the driver owner segment, they don't usually have much of a credit history. So how do you overcome an issue like that? And are there some peculiarities in the electric vehicle market which really allow you to lend to the sector more easily? So explain some of that for us. Yeah, so um, it's a very interesting and a complex question. I think first of all, um, I've spoken to a lot of uh, people across the world. And I think one thing I commonly hear is the biggest imped impediment to electric vehicle adoption is lack of financing, right? So in that sense, financing is going to become or is already the largest enabler of electric vehicles. Um, now, if I look at our, uh, you know, one of the things that we did as an organization very early on, we said that we must, uh, because we are financing electric vehicles, we started about five years back. Uh, electric vehicles were still quite new uh, and still are actually today. So we said we must differentiate customer risk from product risk. And we must look at both those separately, and we must solve for both of them separately. Uh, because traditionally, finances generally tend to focus only on customer risk. Uh, so let me just talk about customer risk first, and then I'll come to product risk. Uh, a lot of our customers, as you said, uh, are financially excluded. 85% um, of them have no credit history. Almost none of them have any uh, relevant banking transactions. Uh, most of our customers haven't uh, done formal schooling beyond the age of 10. Uh, so very poor uh, language skills, low level of education, living in small towns, no credit history, no banking transactions. How do you underwrite them? Um, we said, uh, you know, we must try and focus on human behavior rather than credit behavior. And maybe we said that human behavior will give us hints as to how they perform on, on their financial products. So one of the first things that we did is we said, you know, we partnered with the university and we said, let's build a psychometric assessment tool that can help measure intention to repay. Yeah. Um, and since we were financing uh, commercial vehicles, we knew the ability to repay was getting created through the products we were financing. So our focus was clearly on intention. So I think uh, somewhere we got that right. Uh, you know, we obviously uh, get all customers to go through a psychometric test. Uh, but then that gives us a good outcome, so we're able to select really well. It's interesting, for the last five years, we've been able to keep our non-performing assets below 1% as well, so the customer selection has definitely been right. Um, right, And then uh, we also said, not just um, their behavior at the time when, we are, uh, when they're applying, but we, we must study their behavior afterwards as well. So we embedded telematics in all the vehicles that we finance. Through telematics, we can look at driver, driving behavior, acceleration, uh, turning, sharp turning, how they charge, how they maintain their vehicles, how the batteries are, are performing, and so on and so forth. Uh, right, so that gives us a very good idea of how they maintain their vehicles, but also very interestingly, because it's a commercial use case, how much they're driving. Every kilometer driven translates into income for them. 
so that's also very critical for us to track uh, for different types of end use cases, whether it's a delivery driver versus a passenger vehicle, two wheelers, three wheeler, four wheeler. So we, uh, with geography, and and every end use case in every geography has a different level of income that a person can make uh, per kilometer that they drive. So we track all of that to understand uh, our users much better, and obviously to ensure that uh, they perform well on their loans. So that's on the customer side. Now let me talk about the product side. Product side is uh, also as complex, if not more. Uh, electric vehicle manufacturing, as Jimmy was saying, is a lot of local uh, manufacturing, a lot of new startups coming up. Uh, in India, there are over 1,000 manufacturers of electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Uh, so who do you work with? Which are the good ones? <laughs> so that was the first question. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there is, uh, so, you know, which are the good products? How do you assess the products? So we've actually built capabilities in terms of identifying the right OEMs, the right products. We have an engineering team that actually assesses uh, products and manufacturing technology and processes before we actually uh, finance them. Um, so so we, we do that, and then uh, we uh, look at after-sales service that uh, OEMs provide and infrastructure around the vehicles, because that's very critical. Um, you know, a lot of uh, battery infrastructure is not very well set up across the country, which means if there's any issues with the battery, it has to go back to the manufacturing plant to get replaced. It takes about 10, 15 days. That's loss of income for our driver. So that's not, that's not ideal. Uh, so what we really started doing is we said uh, two things. One is we will partner with manufacturers and we will make them participate in the product risk. Right? And in two ways. We said if there's a loss to us because of product-related issues, you have to share that risk with us. Equally, there is no secondary market, and until there's a secondary market, nobody's going to finance the vehicles. So we said we have to start creating secondary markets. So we, along with the manufacturers and their dealerships all across the country, we created micro-secondary markets everywhere, which means if a product comes back, it gets refurbished and resold through those dealerships. Right? So that really helped us mitigate a lot of the product-related risks. Uh, finally, uh, what we're also doing is we've started working on uh, second life, end of life, et cetera. So we've actually, again, built an engineering team uh, that's working on vehicles that are coming back to see if we can actually extend their life, whether on batteries or on vehicles itself. And of course, start working on second life use cases. And we've seen some green shoots over there in terms of especially uh, residential use. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, areas of India where there's no electricity or, or throughout the day. So you can actually uh, use those batteries through with, with inverters to actually power the homes. Thank you. That is such a fascinating list of what Refin does, and uh, particularly with your s customer segment, uh, the fact that you have such extraordinary data on, uh, on them and their driving habits uh, must be invaluable to many other emerging markets as yeah. well, so, I imagine. No, we've got about 700 million miles of driving history with us now, and that's across the country in about 23 states. That's amazing. That's a very valuable uh, data set and really would be very, very helpful for many, many other countries in a similar position, I would imagine. Um, Mayank, I'm going to come to you now. Um, you know, we've been talking about advice recommendations and I also notice there are now well over 20 questions in the, uh, in the Q&A. So thank you uh, to all of you uh, for asking those questions. I will get to them uh, shortly. But uh, Mayank, turning to you, what are some of the recommendations that you would uh, provide to private sector companies, governments as well, we've been talking about them, who want to move towards decarbonizing the, the transport yeah, sector? And it's a very important question because I don't want to uh, point to either one private sector or one government. I want to point out to the entire stakeholder community uh, uh, because this, is, this actually uh, journey is well and truly underway. You know, it is happening. Uh, but it is so different from decarbonization of uh, energy generation because that's relatively easier. You have like few large point sources and so it's easy to have those conversations with them and, and transition them towards cleaner. But here you have like millions and millions of individual users and, and have, you have to demonstrate the benefits and, 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 and bring them along with this journey of actually from a cost perspective, but also from a climate change perspective, right? So, so I, I would say there are three or four buckets I would, or I would point out uh, which, where all of us need to apply our minds and work together. One is, I think some of it was already mentioned by Philip and, and Jamie, is this range anxiety and then this creation of this infrastructure, which is extremely important. And as, and you can tell me, uh, uh, I can tell you, uh, having looked at all these transactions, that's a financially not a very viable business at this stage. 
you know, putting charging infrastructure across country is a is a is a very very low IR or actually losing proposition from it. So therefore, uh, you know, governments and, and MDBs, uh, we all need to come together to create this infrastructure. And also, there is some technology evolution still happening. There are safety issues uh, with uh, with vehicles. Uh, the ICE technology is tested over 100 years or so. Uh, where people are very comfortable with it. This is a very new technology, and and there are still. So I think we all need to work on, on uh, communications and, and you know get people educated and and get the right quality standards in place so that you know in the, the right kind of vehicles come on the roads. That's one part of it. The second, and this is a part where I am actually personally very you know, uh, uh, want to see some real movement happening is that this, uh, I would call it a revolution, should not happen like the previous move towards, you know, uh, carbon-based transport, which is where your raw material is in hands of few countries and then it becomes subject to geopolitical risks and the countries which do not have that resource actually end up importing a lot of inflation for no fault of theirs, right? So we all must work together creating resilient supply chains, well-diversified supply chains, supply chains that meet international best practices on social, environmental, governance, transparency, uh, you know, so that's uh, our role as MDBs actually, so we are very much focused on it. We will, uh, through the stakeholder community, work on, on, on that aspect. Third, and, and that really gets missed out entirely, is that there is a whole big industry of after-sales services employing millions of people in our DMCs, which actually repair, drive, you know, uh, support ICE vehicle industry, they will lose their jobs as, as, as this electrification happens. And this, as, uh, as we all know, fewer moving parts, fewer need to, uh, to repair. So, so how do you transition while making sure that the people who are actually working in that industry do not, you know, be, feel uh, left behind? So in terms of retrainings, re-education, new employment opportunities, again, that is an area which, which, which we, need, we need to focus on. So I would say there are a lot of challenges. I mean, yes, there is a big opportunity, but, but we need to address these challenges if we are to see actually a, a smooth and just transition to an electric, uh, mo uh, mo electrically mobile future. Thank you for that, Mayank. And in fact, there's a great question here about after-sales services, which I hope to, uh, to uh, uh, ask you a little bit later. Uh, thank you again to the audience for uh, contributing such marvelous questions. Um, I'm going to go to Jamie next before I move on to the questions. Um, so tell us a little bit, and obviously you have told us a lot about what the ADB does, but tell us what the ADB does specifically to try to build awareness, because communication, education is a crucial thing, as Bayang just said, uh, to build the awareness of supporting uh, the scaling up of e-mobility in a lot of uh, developing countries and, and in terms of their policies and actions. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's quite lucky in the fact that this is such a dynamic environment that we're working, working in or supporting in terms of e-mobility, so that awareness, there is a lot of interest. Um, but the way we're looking at it, we've got to understand what is out there, put that in front of the right people so we're raising the awareness. But most importantly is downstream action. And that might require piloting until we can scale it up. So that awareness program takes many different things, but it's really putting the information in front of it from supply chains to second or end of life, looking at all of those components and making sure people are aware perhaps more directly working with the governments in terms of ensuring that those transport policies are brought across into the broader climate policies. A number of piloting, we, we, we were looking at electric fishing boats, I know, but I guess this is covered under e-mobility, but can they operate in the real world environment and how do they compete with more traditional um, forms of transport? So yes, we can look at the two wheelers, three wheelers, because they're beyond that tipping point. But local community fishing boats, are they at a point now where we could look at e-fishing e boats? Um, I mean, here we're talking individual fishermen going out for a few hours a day, not international trawlers going the far part, but some of it's piloting. And as we heard right from the outset, really the scaling up is where the private sector comes in. So we've been working with um, 
awareness campaigns doing every two weeks, a webinar. We've been holding a number of seminars, looking at training development. And, and within our clients on the sovereign side, we convened a whole e-mobility workshop up in, up in Seoul, Korea. And the key output there was to talk to those governments about what technical or financial support they may need to build those policies or accelerate it, it, with the enabling environment and the uptake of e-mobility. Happy to say there was 18 countries there and it led to potential of about 30, 40 different investment opportunities for sovereign or non-sovereign support. That's an awful lot, but how do we put those financing into there and follow through? I, I, um, Ramesh, in his opening statement, mentioned some Green Climate Fund giving, providing 170 million and with our money close to half a billion in terms of those investments. So that's the action. Now, is it a direct cause and effect between holding a webinar and seeing half a billion dollars of investments? I think you'd be hard pushed to say, yes, this webinar led to half a billion dollars, but without that awareness raising engagement, working with governments, working with private sector, piloting investments to see whether they, how they operate in the real world. There is, in, in my mind, and in, in within ADB more broadly, there is a direct relationship between the rapid increase we're seeing on sovereign and particularly non-sovereign support and our ability to bring in the world's leading experts in e-mobility, working with Slowcat and others in terms of the global debate, but putting that at the local city level, putting that at the national level, and seeing how we can accelerate that uptake in e-mobility. So definitely in terms of raising the awareness, looking at actions, what are the priorities, what makes sense commercially, financially, and how do we um, really accelerate that uptake? Thanks. Wonderful, thank you. Now, because I did get so many questions after imploring you all to ask questions, I'm going to move on to the questions before I ask my final uh, question now. And there are so many here that are, are so excellent, but I, I think, you know, uh, we really want to hear more about Together. So the a question here about, um, did Together find foreign institutions, uh, investors eager to get involved with the green bonds um, and to get, to get her managed to go beyond the domestic investor base uh, with this endeavor. So tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you for the question. Like uh, since last year, we've seen the many development banks and international financial organization and DFIs who are eager to work with us in many different directions. So as I mentioned, we are mainly automotive industry company, but our infrastructure here in Georgia is the biggest one. Uh, we have service centers all over the country. We have uh, showrooms for the automotive uh, directions and brand showrooms and etc. So um, the short term strategy in terms of the energy efficiency we do have, we do have this strategy to implement uh, solar panels in all of our buildings. That's another story as well, and it's related to the driving to even ability, but still uh, we see other financial organization, ADB as well, to work with us who they want to finance us in terms of the efficiency and immobility as well. So uh, this uh, five times uh, commitment to reinvest 20 million lari, this won't stop here. We are committed to improving our investment in terms of the greener economy in Georgia and not only. Thank you for that. Um, there are so many questions. I'm <laughs> really having to, to have a, a look through there. But um, here's, a, here's a good one, and it's a very open one that any one of you can answer. What do you see of the three major barriers that constrain e-mobility development? Big question. What are the three Anyone want to pick up on this? If you had to pinpoint three, go on then, Philip. I think you've got an answer for this. Just three? <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a long list, I know, but just three. What are the top three barriers? Um, if I look at a, a, a city transport perspective, there, there is the, the upfront cost. Um, that, that's always a, a, a significant barrier for for cities to actually deal with. But I think this is where national governments can play an important role in supporting cities by giving them that financial assistance. So I, th so I think that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, again, for city authorities, it is the, the, the infrastructure requirements. 
Um, also, where you're going to be, say, for your buses, putting your depots, how that fits within the wider transport system. It takes a very long time to get all the necessary agreements, contracts, etc., uh, between the, the different authorities, different energy providers as well. So there is that, that kind of time challenge as well, because you're... you're Cities are dealing with new partners that they don't really, they haven't had a relationship really before. Um, so so that, this is all new to them. Um, and I think related to that is, is a lot of the technical new skills and the sharing of best practices. Um, I hear so many cities saying we spent uh, roughly 50% of our time getting it wrong. Uh, we wish we could fo um, follow other people that, that, that went first. Not, not everyone wants to go first. So I think that, that's always a challenge around this kind of institutional learning. So if I, I was going to pick three, it'd be those, but, but like I said, there are a few more. Yeah, it's, it's a long list, but we're getting there and we're, we're trying to narrow that list down. Um, here's a question for Samir, and it was really fascinating hearing you speak about the, the customers that you have, many of whom are unbanked. A uh, question here about how is the electric vehicle electric charging infrastructure organized in smaller towns and cities in India? And are there common charging facilities specifically for e-rickshaws? Okay, so I think uh, a bit of a myth buster. Yeah. Electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers don't require any special charging infrastructure. You can charge them in any plug point, yeah. uh, right? So I say to everybody, there are 250 million homes in India. There are 250 million charging points in India. Uh, right, so uh, I think, so yeah, charging infrastructure wise not required. When you look at use cases where you have a large uh, number of fleets operating vehicles for uh, last mile deliveries, e-commerce deliveries, over there certainly you require uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, it's not sufficient, uh, but also it's not commercially viable, as was said earlier. Um, you know, we see public charging infrastructure utilization is only 4% in India, and private charging infrastructure utilization is 12%. I'm not sure how money can be made out of that. All right, so yes, it'll take time um, uh, to build that kind of infrastructure. I think it will be built. Um, I think um, in certainly in uh, a lot of the large cities, there is sufficient infrastructure. In a city like Delhi, there'll be probably more than 500 public charging stations, and that's enough for a city. And of course, a few thousand private ones as well. Right, so I think, yeah, it's coming up. But in the smaller towns, you don't need that really. Not for two-wheelers and three-wheelers. And here's, in fact, another follow-up. Uh, and again, this is about your, your, uh, your unbanked sector that we talked about earlier. Um, elaborate a little bit more about how you're addressing the lending and payment needs of the unbanked sectors, uh, you know, many of your consumers uh, within e-mobility in India. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I mean, that's what we do, right? We give them loans, uh, uh, mostly their first loans, uh, to buy electric vehicles. Uh, they drive these electric vehicles, and the people who are buying le electric vehicles were actually in some other profession previously, so they were not driving anything before that. A lot of barbers, factory workers, and you know, casual labor and things like that. And they've really, uh, after buying these vehicles, they've really gone on from earning maybe a hundred dollars a month to about three hundred to four hundred dollars a month through electric vehicles, uh, right? So I think that's a huge sort of uh, economic change in their life, but then. Because of that, also social change, things like you know the children being being able to go to school and you know so on and so forth. Yeah, so I think uh, so. I mean that's what we do, and uh, yeah. Don't have to be so humble about it. That's quite extraordinary what you do. <laughs> uh, now we talked a little bit about the after sales uh, service element earlier, and Mayank, you you spoke about it specifically. So well, why don't you take this question? Um, after sales services seem to be rather critical, including safety standards, especially in South Asia. How does ADB plan to integrate that towards supporting adoption of e-vehicles? Yeah, that's very, and it's related to a little bit to what I mentioned earlier is the quality standards. You know, you work with uh, national governments, the state governments to actually put in place uh, appropriate quality standards, certification of vehicles before they come on the road. So that's the upfront work which you do. And then as, you know, it is way, it's after sales service, it's all part of the same puzzle, you know. Uh, which came first? Will, should the network come first or should the vehicles come first? Uh, so this is all, uh, 
market driven pretty much at the end of the day we can do something governments can do something but at the end of the day uh, if there is a business proposition there these services uh, service centers will come up so it will start with larger cities which will have charging infrastructure they will have after sale services in smaller cities and towns there will be cottage industry which will develop uh, people will get employment opportunities uh, they will they'll start fixing these uh, and and so no, it will develop organically. But the most important thing is the quality uh, of the vehicles, which is because it's, it's a safety issue. Uh, it is uh, so that is the most important thing is to have a standardized quality across countries, across uh, you know battery types and products, so the, to ensure that you know um, spurious products are not coming into the market because it's basically a very big risk. Well, thank you for addressing that. Here's another question. It's got one vote, and it's really quite interesting because I think it ties in what you mentioned uh, earlier, Jamie. You were talking about e-mobility fishing boats. This is a question about shipping at large. Where do we stand, and what are the prospects for making it environmentally friendly? We know that shipping is not part of our conversation here today, but it is huge uh, in terms of its um, carbon emissions. So maybe just a, a brief uh, uh, you know, response to that. Sure, yeah. Maybe it's... H mobility hydrogen is, is what we should be talking about. But as Philip was saying, sort of 2014, we saw a change. I think in the maritime subsector, um, there has been a change in the last three, four years. Um, bringing them into the climate debate more generally, IMO and the international maritime has happened. But similar to e mobility, the key players will drive this. Maersk and some of the big operators have made that decision on where their future investments will be in terms of their vessel fleet. They have decided that hydrogen is the way forward and will be making investments in there. We're already seeing sort of the green corridor between Asia and North America across the Pacific. Now that is again doing. But we're also within, within our region looking at it's more of a hub and spoke at a smaller scale. So if Singapore is a collector port, how do Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Southeast Asia more generally, Thailand and so on, how do they feed in to that collect distributor? On, in, and what type of boats would, or vessels would we see there? The interesting point I, I mentioned earlier, so sort of a little bit on the maritime sector, e-vehicles compared to ICE vehicles, there is op, um, less friction, therefore they're more efficient. The power unit of hydrogen to, compared to sort of bunker fuels currently within the maritime, they're not that efficient. So it will dramatically change the routing that is possible because the size of the vessels, the ships will have to change. Um, maybe I'm always the optimist, but we are hoping that this would dramatically improve accessibility to our Pacific uh, countries within the Asian Development Bank. If large ships are going across the Pacific without the need to stop, maybe when we make this transition to ethanol or hydrogen, there is a greater need to change those routes and therefore there will be stop-offs at points that historically may have happened, but as the vessels got larger and more efficient, there was no need, which may reduce the, the, the transportation costs and provide more accessibility. I, I would like to say finally that, yes, climate change is very important, e-mobility or H-mobility is very important, but transport is a neighbor of development and it must be about access. So we're looking at some of those points in the maritime where that opportunity for increased access to those lifelines that the maritime provides to particularly the island states, which are very um, remote in many cases, how can we ensure that there is some kind of shift to a cleaner, a better and more sustainable future? Thank you. Thank you. I think that deserves a whole panel on, it, on its own. It's uh, shipping, isn't it? Um, we've got so many great questions here, but we are uh, running out of time. I will just do one more question. And, uh, you know, this is, again, that question around, okay, which countries should we try to emulate? A um, uh, question around, why is India such a front-runner in this, in e-mobility, and how do other countries catch up? But we know it's not just India. In the video earlier, it was China as well. So anyone wants to pick up on, you know, how well these countries are doing, what should we look to in terms of uh, emulating in policies that put, they've put into place? Jamie? Just very quickly, I think 
the collective institutions working on those policies in, in, in those two countries you meant, and in other countries, Georgia and, and Vietnam, and the, the, those others that have been highlighted. It's bringing together the right institutions within the government, working with the private sector to ensure that those investments are de-risked and therefore accelerated. And that's what India has done, that's what China has done, that's what many others, Georgia, Vietnam, Thailand, that we see as front runners in our region are pushing the agenda very fast. You know, so I'll just uh, add on to a little bit. China is obviously way far ahead because they actually China was able to build a whole ecosystem of, you know, from raw materials to manufacturing and, and government, very strong government push. Some of these moves are also dictated by the countries and its resource availability, right? So, for example, in a country like India, which almost 85% of its uh, requirement of uh, fossil fuels is imported for, for vehicles, it is an in, in energy independence issue also. You know, so that if you can create a, a EV uh, ecosystem, then it actually uh, you know reduces the reliance on imported uh, imported fuel. Uh, so there are policy levers, there are push levers, there are pull levers. Uh, um, government has actually uh, come up with a very large subsidy program for both for customers per se, purchasing vehicles. It's called FAME, and also for producers, it's called production and incentives. So so it gives an upfront push uh, to reduce, bring down the cost uh, so that it can there is can be a fast adoption and then government has also announced that it is go going to procure only electric vehicles all government procurements are going to be electric so then that gives a demand a minimum demand uh, which actually manufacturers can actually start planning their production based on that demand and and then it also allows them economies of scale so i think some of these things uh, if government does right it can actually create a, a, a sort of environment which then feeds on itself and, and cre creates a virtuous cycle. Excellent. A virtuous cycle, that's what we want to hear. Not a vicious cycle, a virtuous one. Now, I am going to ask my final question. Thank you all, by the way, for those great questions. There are so many here. If we didn't get a chance to answer them, please do come and find our wonderful panelists later on, perhaps at the reception later, and you can pick up from the conversation. Uh, but my final question to all of you is the same one, and do just answer fairly briefly. We've only got eight minutes left in this session. I'll start with Samir at the end. You know, this is your classic uh, crystal ball gazing question. Where do you see e-mobility in 10 years from now? Samir. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I've formed the opinion that uh, e-mobility or mobility in general is more about different use cases and identifying the right sort of vehicle technology for that use case. Um, right, so when we look at last mile, uh, mobility, either passengers or delivery, certainly electric vehicles, and I would expect to see generally across the world that transition would have happened. Um, right, and then uh, when it comes to uh, larger forms of vehicles, um, trucks, freight trucks, buses, etc., I think it's going to be a combination of hydrogen and electric. But again, I see almost a complete uh, transition globally over there as well. And finally, I think when it comes to uh, sort of uh, personal use vehicles, four wheelers, etc., personally, I don't see a use case for electric vehicles at all, uh, right? And I think from an even from an energy security uh, or energy diversity perspective, I think it's good to use different fuel forms. So if electric, hydrogen, uh, petrol, diesel, all of those forms coexisting, then I think all of them, uh, you know, then you there's no scarcity. And, and, and also, there's no not much impact on pollution as well. Right, so that's how I see it. All right, 10 years from now, that's your vision. Jamie, what's yours? Um, for Asia and the Pacific, I see an acceleration, particularly in those lower hanging fruit, the urban fleet vehicles, the two wheelers, the three wheelers, where that tipping point has been reached. The problem might actually be the supply to be able to keep up with that accelerated take up of demand. Um, but the, the, the harder to, uh, the harder to serve e-vehicles, the longer distance buses, the trucks. That may take longer on a more traditional sort of expectation, but I do believe the smaller urban fleets, we will see a rapid increase with the de-risking of just mentioned in terms of that bulk purchase, manufacturing, scaling up. Um, what sort of numbers we're looking at? Maybe quadrupling in the next 10 years in terms of the smaller vehicles, but please, 
come and find me and see whether we're anywhere near it at that time. We Thank will you. be talking about this in 10 years. I will hold you to that. And Manana, your thoughts, particularly here in Georgia, what are your ambitions in 10 years when it comes to e-mobility? Yeah, I would love to emphasize on Georgia. So 10% uh, of the revenues of Ticket are driven from the e-mobility and EV sales as of today. And I hope to think this number growing by 50% uh, since in the trucks direction and bus direction as well. That's uh, quite new for the country as well. And uh, EV light vehicles are growing. So like for the last year as well and this year, we've introduced uh, maybe three brands, new brands, the Chinese ones as well, uh, who are very new to the country. But um, in terms of the numbers, I would love to say that in the first week of introducing this exact brand, we've sold in a one week 20 units. So that's the demand. That's where we see the growing. Excellent. And I guess 20 units in a week, that's, that's good. That's good. Excellent. That's good to know. Good, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. It's great. Brilliant. Okay. Maya. So from my perspective, uh, ever the optimist, uh, so I will actually break it up into two parts. One is on an overall macro basis. I really see uh, a resilient uh, supply chains, uh, well diversified supply chains, countries, uh, you know, able to source from different sources uh, without being dependent on single source and, and, and this whole uh, ecosystem of uh, uh, you know, mining, uh, assembling, manufacturing, sales, actually getting well developed across our, our region. Uh, that is one on um, on the overall market side. And, and on uh, for our, us in the private sector operations department of ADB, I would really hope that we are able to scale up uh, our support to this industry by multi-billion dollars uh, over the, the 10 years or so. So we are really putting a lot of focus on getting it right, getting the right instruments, the right right financing structure so that we can actually, you know, rule out this across our DMCs. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And Philip, uh, if you're going to attend COP in 10 years from now, and presumably you'll still be attending, how do you want to see this particular, uh, you know, segment e-mobility being represented? What a delightful prospect. <laughs> um, I, I would really like, well, I hope, um, we have a better appreciation of e-mobility and the policies and how it can really um, kickstart uh, the decarbonisation of mobility as a whole uh, in the most cost-effective way of doing it. I think the real opportunity is around passenger transport in urban environments. Um, it accounts for 40% of transport emissions in itself. Um, I would like to see greater uptake of e-mobility with the combination of the original sources of e-mobility, sorry, zero emissions mobility, that's walking and cycling, but also in combination with public transport, I think it's a totally underappreciated uh, climate solution. It avoids 50% of emissions in cities. And when I say avoid, that's also compact cities, which make it nicer, more pleasant to walk and cycle around. It avoids congestion so car drivers can have a more pleasant journey themselves. And simply, if you double public transport and walking and cycling in cities, the usage of it, you cut uh, emissions by half in cities. Um, and if you just electrify that public transport network, which is already quite highly electrified in cities anyway, you can really kickstart this decarbonisation in the most cost-effective way. Picking up on Jamie's point, you enhance accessibility, you improve air quality, reduce congestion. And I think, for me, um, that just makes the economic case for its investment. So I think we really need to look beyond just looking at the technology or the mode of transport and really looking at a whole systems change. And I, I'll kind of give you an, my, my final example about my favorite e-mobility thing and how it can really transform cities. So in Gothenburg in Sweden, there's Route 54, which is an electric bus line, and it has a bus stop uh, in the middle of a library because they wanted to show to citizens how silent the e-mobility solutions are. And I think if you consider that, then it actually is a game changer for urban planning decisions. You know, you can have bus stops in hospitals, it makes it so much easier. And I think it, you can completely transform how you do, you know, waste collection within cities, so on and so forth. So I would hope to see that change in policy and understanding, and then we'll be in a good place. Excellent. Well, what a wonderfully 
appealing glimpse into our future. Imagine having uh, e-mobility bus stops in the middle of a library, hospital, etc., etc. Of course, we never talked about the walking and cycling, but that's a fundamental part as well. We need to go back to that sort of transport and that sense of a mobility. But what an excellent session this has been. Uh, you all brought so much to the debate and there is so much to think about yet uh, and, and so many more challenges to surmount. But it looks like Asia Pacific is already in that role. So are countries like Georgia. So a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, audience, for those great questions as well. Much appreciated. And if we didn't manage to answer your questions, uh, do um, come and ask us a little bit later. Thank you all. <laughs>